At our number 10 spot, we have The Exorcist True Story. So the true story of The Exorcist is based on The Exorcist of Roland Doe in 1949. Roland Doe was actually an alias, but you'll find out who he is at the end of this point. So how Roland first got a taste of the occult was from his beloved Aunt Harriet, who is a spiritualist who even taught Roland how to use a Ouija board. Roland was only 16 when the aunt passed away, and this is the time when he and his family reported hearing scratching sounds on the walls and footsteps around the house when no one else was home. At first, they expected it to be the aunt, so they used the Ouija board to reach out to her, but this only made things worse. Eventually, scratches on the walls would become scratches on his body, with words being carved out literally in his skin. Soon after, the boy started to manifest some dark stuff and evil intentions. So the mom called out for a Catholic priest to perform exorcism. Eventually, the boy would get rid of the demon and live out the rest of his life. And guess what his real identity was? Ronald Edwin Hunkler. And he was a NASA engineer who patented a special technology to make panels resistant to extreme heats. So maybe the devil must have left his powers in him. So. At our number 9 spot, we have the exorcism of Emily Rose, the true story. The story is based on a German girl named Elise Michael who was born in 1952. Her early life was completely normal until she turned 16. This is when she started to display uncontrollable shaking, being in a trance-like state, and sometimes would just completely black out. When she went to the hospital to see what's up, the doctors diagnosed her with psychosis and epilepsy. For those who don't know, epilepsy is a disorder that can cause seizures, so Annalise was given some medications for it. It didn't take long, however, until she started hearing the voices of demons inside of her head. Also, this accompanied visions of the devil and she developed a strong dislike for holy objects. After being originally disproved by the church, her symptoms only got worse. She would then be eating spiders, crawling on the floors, and only after it got really bad is when the bishop issued a local pastor named Arnold Renz to perform an exorcism on her. He attempted an exorcism over 60 times over the span of 10 months, but she eventually stopped eating and passed away from malnourishment and dehydration. She was just 23 years old. Old. After her passing, this got worldwide attention. However, the two priests involved in the exorcism got charged with negligent homicide and sentenced to six months in jail. And not so fun fact, there's a clip of the exorcism audio recording on YouTube in pretty great detail, so go check it out if you dare. At number 8 spot, we have Switching Languages. This one comes from Reddit user Sorkajan. So this user's dad was a preacher and evangelist at a very young age, but it wasn't until the dad was 52 when they took a mission trip to Russia and his whole perspective of the devil changed. To give specifics, this event took place in 1993 in Ulanos, Russia. In a huge auditorium which had around 10,000 people, a lady claimed to have been possessed. When the crowd began to pray for her and an exorcism was being performed, everyone could see her shaking convulsively and wailing her eyes out. As the time progressed, things were more intense. Her eyes started to roll back to the back of her head and she started to speak a language that everyone in the building swore they never heard ever. After a short pause, she looked into the user's dad's eyes and in a perfect American accent said, quote, this is my domain. You are not allowed here. You will suffer the lake of fire for your heresy. At a number seven spot, we have Mother Teresa. It's believed that Mother Teresa underwent an exorcism but wasn't exactly possessed. For those who don't know who this is, Mother Teresa was a nun and missionary who devoted her life into caring for the sick, the poor, and the disabled. She's actually a saint as well. Before her passing in September 1997, it was revealed by Archbishop Henry de Souza that in 1996, Teresa was admitted to the hospital where doctors said she would be completely restless. Doctors would find nothing wrong with her to explain her restlessness, so de Souza considered that an evil spirit may be disturbing her. He then brought in the priest Rosario to perform an exorcism and Mother Teresa agreed. During the exorcism, she described the nun quote, a little dazed and behaved strangely, but a protection prayer. Regardless, the devil is somewhere in those shadows working behind the scenes. At a number six spot, we have George Luckins. In 1778, former tailor George Luckins showcased pretty strange behavior. He would be speaking in strange manipulated voices and singing hymns backwards with many report what they heard as sounds humans cannot make. A member of the parish church named Sarah Barber first came across George and she also knew him prior, describing him as a good church going man with no previous issues whatsoever. When taken to the doctors, no one knew what was up with him. George would later claim that he's being possessed by seven demons and that seven clergymen will be needed to drive them out. So in a ceremony held in Bristol Temple Church, seven priests commanded the demons who had apparently taken over his soul to leave once and for all. This ceremony ended in a success with a demon being driven out of George, causing his seizures to go away completely. Right in the hump of our list, we have Dr. Richard Gallagher and Julia. This is the most recent case on our list, being in 2008, if that counts for anything. So psychiatrist and teacher Richard E. Gallagher claimed that one of his patients under the alias Julia had experienced a demonic possession. This was no regular mental breakdown disguised as a possession, but a lot more real than that. She would speak in unknown languages, levitate objects around the room, and in one phone call, she would speak to the doctor 
mocked her with demonic growls and in a demonic tone. Eventually, Julia herself seeked out an exorcist to help her get rid of it. The odd thing is, is that Gallagher noted that during this time, Julia was a part of a satanic cult and would refuse to leave. She would eventually get rid of the demon for good, and to this day, this case remains a scientific mystery as much as a paranormal mystery as well. At number four spot, we have Michael Taylor. This story begins when Michael's wife accused him of cheating, and she would back this up by claiming his behavior was very unusual and just not like him. At one point, he would randomly lash out at his mistress, both physically and verbally, all while shouting at her in tongues. This is when a group of people had to restrain him. She described his appearance as bestial and how he was staring at her with this wild look in his eyes. His behavior got so bad, they decided to seek out help in the form of priests. During an eight hour exorcism session, the priest claimed to have pulled out a total of 40 demons within him, but left three in him, which were murder, madness, and violence. Then they sent the home for some reason. This was an obvious red flag, and Michael would be found hours later in the street naked and covered in blood. When the police arrived at his home, they discovered one of the most brutal sights they'd ever seen. Michael had brutally attacked Christine, removing her eyes and tongue before ripping her face from her skull. He then strangled the family dog, and once the dog passed away, he removed its eyes as well before breaking the dog into pieces and throwing it around the house. The house was covered in blood from ceiling to floor. At a number three spot, we have Claire Germana Seal. In 1906, a 16 year old named Claire was heard making a pact with Satan himself, meaning no good implications follow the story. Then, shortly after, nuns at the orphanage school she was staying at claimed that Seal was growling, hissing, ripping her clothes off, and demanding to speak with the priests. At this time, the nuns and priests reported that she had the strength of an adult and spoke different foreign languages, in which she had never had exposure to before. Then, out of the blue, she began to levitate, causing Father Horner and Reverend Masudi to report it and they gained permission to conduct an exorcism. It lasted a total of two days and her skin was constantly burning due to the holy water and she was caught levitating by over 150 witnesses. Everyone noted smelling a distinct nauseous smell, leaving her body as they suspected when the devil left. At number two spot, we have Gut Leiben Didis. German neighbors became suspicious of strange activities occurring at the home of Gut Leiben Didis, who was a 28 year old lady in 1842. Didis claimed that her home was haunted and soon started falling in and out of what others claimed was a trance-like state. But it wasn't until religious ministers started an exorcism that things really started to spiral out of control and Didis needed to be restrained physically. Didis vomited glass, nails, and blood for two agonizing years while the pastor engaged in numerous exorcism rituals. Finally, Didis said that Jesus is Victor and the demons had finally left her. At number one spot, we have Anna Eklund. The early exorcism, otherwise known as the exorcism of Anna Eklund, is the most famous case of demonic possession, not only in the state of Iowa, but throughout the whole world. The Exorcist movie took small bits of inspiration from what went down of this. At a young age, she would suffer from demonic voices in her head to do unimaginable things. In the beginning, you could make an argument for schizophrenia, but as time went by, she would find herself unable to enter a church, could detect food that had been blessed, and would despise other holy objects. Her family would then seek out help from Father Reisinger, who was specialized in exorcism. To test if she was faking, the priest would spray her with fake holy water, and she didn't react to that. Then on June 18, 1912, the priest performed an exorcism on the 30 year old, and after that, she went back to normal. Except in the next few years, Anna claimed to be tormented by the spirit of her dead father and Anne. So the priest came back, except this time in secret. During the exorcism, Anna dislodged herself from her bed, floated in the air, and howled extremely loud. When asked who possessed Anna, the demon responded, it's Beelzebub, Judas, Anna's father, and her aunt Mina. After the exorcism was complete, Anna lived out the rest of her life quietly until passing away in 1941. At number 10 spot, we have the exorcism of Gina. In the year 1990, New York native Reverend James Labar oversaw three different exorcisms, all of which were approved by both the Cardinal John O'Connor, which was the Archbishop of New York at the time, and even the Vatican. One of these cases, the exorcism of the Florida girl Gina, was broadcast on national television in 1991 on the ABC network. The ceremony, which featured music in the style of the Middle Ages, was described by Newsweek as, quote, nothing more than the needless agony of a severely unhappy young girl. She was restrained to a chair, screaming and barking incoherently as the reverend thrust a cross into her face and even threatened Gina's purported demons with torture if they desired it. And on top of that, others alleged that she was speaking in different languages that she had never known before and her voice kept altering in ways her family have never heard before. And but for the foot of thy womb, Jesus. Please. Holy Mary, Please. Mother of God, no. pray for us in the and the hour. That's part of the objection of the demons to leaving. Somebody help me! I said, 
and I don't want to go. For those who are tuned in, it was very painful to watch. At a number nine spot, we have Terrence Cottrell. Slight trigger warning for this part. Terrence Cottrell, an eight year old kid with autism, passed away in 2003 during a prayer service that was designed to drive away the demonic spirits allegedly responsible for his illness. Yeah. In August 2003, a small group of Christians gathered at the Faith Temple Church in Milwaukee in order to rid the child of apparent demons. They would wrap the kid in cloth, all while pressing down on him. They would scream at the devil to leave his body for hours. Around the two hour mark, they noticed the kid stopped breathing and according to CNN, Terrence was suffocated and external chest compression was determined to be the cause of death. The boy said to have stopped breathing when Reverend Hemphill sat on his chest. The minister was found guilty of murder immediately. During the ensuing trial, it came to light that Reverend Reverend Hemphill had received no formal religious training and was ordained by his older brother. He was convicted of child abuse and sentenced to two and a half years in prison and seven and a half years under state supervision. At number eight spot, we have Elizabeth Knapp. Just 20 years before the infamous Salem witch trials, there was a demonic possession case reported that could be one of the earliest known cases we have today. Elizabeth Knapp was a 16 year old girl who lived in Groton, Massachusetts. The story goes that Elizabeth was the servant at a household of Reverend Samuel Willard. He would be known for his where he would frequently talk about the devil corrupting the youth. So when he started to notice Elizabeth showing those signs, he quickly took action. Elizabeth would show signs such as emotional fits, hysterical laughing, and at one point she began to have hallucinations. And this is when the reverend decided he would call a medical doctor, but when no cure could be found, they just claimed that she was actually possessed by the devil. According to Knapp, the ordeal began when she was visited by the devil one night and made a pact with him. She would sell her soul in exchange for things like money and youth. So when the priest talked to the girl, he noted that it was as if he was talking to the devil directly through the young girl's body. In 1672, Willard's journal entries about Knapp ceased to exist, and to this day, nobody is sure what really happened to this possessed young girl. At number seven spa with Anna Eklund. The early exorcism, otherwise known as the exorcism of Anna Eklund, is a famous case of demonic possession, not only in the state of Iowa, but throughout the entire world. The exorcist movie took small bits of inspiration from what went down in this case. At a young age, she would suffer from demonic voices in her head to do unimaginable things. In the beginning, you could make an argument for schizophrenia, but as time went by, she found herself unable to enter a church, could detect food that has been blessed, and even would despise other holy objects. Her family seeked out help from Father Reisinger, who was specialized in exorcism. To test if she was faking, the priest sprayed her with fake holy water and she didn't react. Then on June 18, 1912, the priest performed an exorcism on 30-year-old Anna, and after, she was back to normal. Except in the next few years, Anna claimed to be tormented by the spirit of her dead father and aunt. So Reisinger came back, except this time in secret. During the exorcism, Anna dislodged herself from the bed, floated in the air, and apparently howled extremely loud. When asked who possessed Anna, the demon responded, it's Beelzebub, Judas Iscariot, Anna's father, and her aunt Mina. After the exorcism was complete, Anna lived out her life quietly until her passing in 1941. At a number six spot, we have the son of Sam. During 1976 to 1977, American serial killer David Berkowitz, otherwise known as the son of Sam, would go on a spree killing six people and wounding an additional seven. He would leave behind letters at his crime scenes indicating that a mysterious figure known as Papa Sam was responsible. It was then revealed by his neighbor that Sam was in fact only his dog, but he claimed that his pet was possessed by a 6,000 year old man who used to drink human blood. So fast forward to prison, he even warned the police that there was more killings that was going to happen and because he was only one puppet to a very large satanic cult. And obviously they couldn't care less about what this guy had to say. I mean, he was in prison for murdering six people. Why would anyone listen to him? But back to the murder he predicted. On the early morning of Halloween in 1981, 39 year old Ronald Sisman and 20 year old Elizabeth Platzman were beaten and shot to death. David predicted all of this, including the exact apartment layout and when the police questioned Ronald Sisman's friend, they said he had never met David or was part of any satanic cult. In the hump of our list, we have The Conjuring House. In January 1971, the Perron family moved into a 14 room farmhouse in Harrisville, Rhode Island, where Carolyn, Roger, and their five daughters began to notice strange things happening almost immediately after they moved in. Carolyn would notice that the broom went missing or seemed to have moved from place to place on its own. She would also hear the sound of something scraping against the kettle in the kitchen when no one was there. She would find small piles of dirt in the center of a newly clean kitchen floor but that could just be the kids. Caroline allegedly researched the history of the home and discovered that it had been in the same family for eight generations and that many of them had passed away under mysterious or even horrible circumstances. Several of the children who used to live in the home had drowned in the nearby lake, one was murdered, and a few of them hanged themselves in the attic. 
Over the next 10 years that the family lived in the house, the Warrens made multiple trips to investigate. And at one point, Lorraine conducted a seance to attempt to contact the spirits that were possessing the family. But during the seance, Carolyn Perron would become possessed, speaking in tongues, and rising from the ground in her chair. At number four spot, we have George Luckins. In 1778, former Taylor George Luckins showcased pretty odd behavior. He would be speaking in a strange, manipulative voice, all while singing hymns backwards. And many of you reported that the sounds you're hearing are sounds that humans just can't make. A member of the parish named Sarah Baber first came across George and she always knew him prior, describing him as a good church going man with no previous issues whatsoever. When taken to the doctors, no one knew what was up with him. George would later claim that he was being possessed by seven demons and that seven clergymen would be needed to drive them out. So in a ceremony held in Bristol's temple church, seven priests commanded the demons who would apparently take over luck and soul to leave once and for all. The ceremony ended in a success with the demon being driven out of George, causing all of his problems to go away including his consistent seizures. Guess this one was a happy ending. What a surprise. At number three spot, we have Michael Taylor. This story goes when Michael's wife accused him of cheating and she would back this up by claiming that his behavior was very unusual and not like him. And he never did that type of stuff before. He would do this all while shouting at her in tongues. And this is when a group of people had to restrain him. She described his appearance as bestial and how he was staring at her with this wild look in his eyes. His behavior got so bad, they decided to seek out help in the form of priests. During an eight hour exorcism session, the priest claimed to have pulled out a total of 40 demons but they left three of them in him, which happened to be murder, madness, and violence. Then they sent him home for some reason. This was an obvious red flag, and Michael would be found hours later in the street naked and covered in blood. When the police arrived at the home, they discovered one of the most brutal sights they've ever seen. Michael had brutally attacked Christine, removing her eyes and tongue before ripping her face from her skull. He then strangled the family dog, and once the dog passed away, he removed its eyes as well before breaking the dog into different pieces, throwing it all around the house. At number two spot with Annalise Michelle. This is the same case that inspired the movie The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Annalise was a normal girl growing up, but by the time she hit the age of 16, everything changed. She began to see the face of the devil everywhere she went, and shortly after, many people including herself believed that she was actually possessed by a real demon. A total of 67 exorcisms were done, and they sounded a little something like this. <laughs> Unfortunately, they did nothing good for this poor girl and she ended up passing away from malnourishment and dehydration. Were these the true sounds of a demon or a troubled girl just looking for proper help? You guys be the judge of that. At number one spot, we have Claire Germana Seal. In 1906, a six year old Claire Seal was heard making a pact with Satan himself, meaning no good implications follow the story. Then, shortly after, nuns at the orphanage school she was at claimed that Seal was growling, hissing, ripping her clothes off, and demanding to speak with priest Father Erasmus Horner. At the time, the nuns and priests reported that she had the strength of an adult and spoke different foreign languages in which she had never been exposed to. Then, out of the blue, she began to levitate, causing Father Horner and Reverend Mansuri to report it, and they gained permission to conduct an exorcism. It lasted a total of two days. Her skin was constantly burning due to the holy water, and she was caught levitating by over 150 witnesses. Everyone noted smelling a distinct nauseous smell, leaving her body as they suspected when the devil finally left her. Kicking it off at number 10 is the Wendigo. A Wendigo is said to be a very rare demon. They are described as strong monsters that have a powerful desire to eat and kill their victims, humans. The legend states that a Wendigo can possess you and turn you into one itself if the person is greedy or weak or wandering the woods alone at night. There are multiple myths talking about what Wendigos look like, but the majority of them describe them to look like an animal, but very tall with a skull as a head, long legs, and their whole body covered in hair and drenched in blood. They are said to be very fast with strength like no other, super hearing, amazing sense of smell, and is said to walk on water just like Jesus. Now at number 9, we have the Ouija board demon. Zozo is a demon who chooses to only come through a Ouija board, giving him the name the Ouija board demon. This is a demon that was directly banished from God himself, so you best know there's a good reason for it. If you decide it's a good idea to play with the Ouija board, this is the demon you may encounter. Just to be sure, he will reveal himself by doing a figure 8 formation on the board and zooming back and forth between the letters Z and O. He's friendly at first, 
but in reality, that's the type of deception Zozo does. He likes to hide and pretend to be other people, mimicking the voices of our loved ones, and sometimes would take the form of their bodies in the shadows. As the game continues, Zozo begins to become more sinister. He is known for breaking objects, installing fear into others, just to have fun. Here at number 8, we have Sirens. Originally, not much was known about the Sirens, because anyone drawn to their calls never came back alive. However, later Roman authors expanded on the idea of Sirens. Some say Sirens are mermaid-like creatures who lived on a remote island surrounded by rocky cliffs. Others say they were formerly handmaids of the goddess Persephone, who is the daughter of Zeus and Demeter. One day, Hades looked above and saw Persephone. He immediately fell in love with her and had asked Zeus for her hand in marriage. Zeus said yes, but Hades knew Demeter would never allow it, so Hades stole her. Demeter gave the handmaids the bodies of birds to assist in the search for her daughter. However, they couldn't find her, so they eventually gave up. The sirens would lure passing sailors by singing to them. Their singing would possess any sailor listening to the point that they would lose all willpower and crash their ship into rocky shores and cliffs, killing everyone aboard. Coming in at number 7, we have Akamana. Zoro Australian mythology speaks of the Akamana. The name loosely translates into mind made of evil. So you guessed it, he is the demon of evil intention and that's exactly what he does while inside of a human host. He gives the appearance of a ram horned humanoid with more than two arms. His purpose is to taint the mind and destroy all morals. Whether it's displaying an indifference to daily responsibilities or blatantly ignoring large scale moral obligations. Akamana plants seeds of evil into human minds including lust, sloth and deceit. Just to give more background, his dad is Satan. And Satan decided to have nine sons, for whatever reason, and all of them were born out of darkness with a single goal to corrupt everything they encountered. Akamana is a hateful but self-loving being who wishes only death upon those other than him and the human he controls. Sliding into number six, voodoo dolls. Now I'm sure we all know what voodoo dolls are, but are they just legend or are they real? Voodoo dolls are said to have originated from Europe. More specifically, the oldest known voodoo doll is said to be from Britain, as far back as the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, it was quite common for magic practitioners, known as cunning folk, to make a doll that looks like a witch and stick it with pins in order to break her spells and hurt her. The legend of voodoo dolls are that if someone has a doll with your energy or essence, for example, a piece of your hair or fingernail or some of your blood, that they can call upon ancient spirits to possess that doll and use witchcraft to link your body to the doll so that whatever happens to the doll happens to you. Halfway there at number 5 we have the yin yang theory. Unless you've been living under a rock, you have definitely seen this symbol. The yin yang theory has penetrated into various traditional Chinese cultural things including the calendar, astronomy, meteorology, Chinese medicine, martial arts, and the list goes on and on. The yin yang theory applies to spirit possession. In general, one is considered to be weak when the yin and the yang in the body are in balance, especially when the yin is on the dominant side. The spirits of the yin side will then take control of these individuals, causing them to associate with negativity and death. These imbalances also determine how weak your soul is. For example, if you had a weak imbalance, this would allow other ghosts and spirits to freely enter your body. To prevent this imbalance, a person must surround themselves with positive energies such as healthy eating, positive relationships, and exercising. Now at number 4 is skinwalkers. Now from what I read, I'm not even supposed to be talking about this because it's bad luck to even talk about it. But I'm doing it for you guys, okay? A skinwalker is basically a witch. Not an exact translation, but very similar. Legend says that skinwalkers committed unspeakable acts in order to gain the power to change their shape into an animal in order to harm. They mimic sounds that might draw someone's attention, like the voice of a loved one or a stranger that might be in trouble, so that they can lure defenseless victims to their death. It's often personal, and it's very much like you having a hex put on you. A hex is kind of like a spell or a curse to control you. Take a look at this video I found on TikTok and be sure to listen very closely. And there's lots of theories that also say that animals can sense and see the supernatural better than anyone can. That horse sprinting in the other direction sells that theory for me. 
Taking our number three spot, we have the jinn. Jinns are entities from Arabic mythology. While jinn are mentioned in the Quran and are thus part of Islam, these spirits are not worshipped in the faith. They are thought to transcend the boundaries of the physical world and are said to be made of smokeless fire. Jinns are also believed to be capable of human possession. They possess the bodily needs of a human being. And to make things worse, jinn actually enjoy punishing humans and are said to be responsible for many diseases and all kinds of accidents. Finally here at number two is real life Annabelle doll. Has anyone seen the horror movie Annabelle? All right, well, fun fact, that movie is actually based on a true story. Now, for the sake of the video, I'm gonna be talking about all the real stuff that happened, not about the stuff in the movie, because not all of it is true. The real-life Annabelle doll was purchased from a store in 1970 and given by a mother to her daughter, Donna, who was a student in nursing school as a birthday present for her 28th birthday. Donna shared a small apartment with her roommate, Angie, who was also a nursing student, and Angie's fiance, Lou. Angie would often come home to find that the doll had been moved. At first, it was subtle, like they would find that the doll had shifted positions from where they last left it, but it started to progress. The doll would show up in Donna's room, sitting in a chair with its arms and legs crossed, standing up on its own, and even kneeling on a chair, and when they tried to put the doll back to that same position, it would just fall. Donna said that she would come home to find messages written in childlike writing on parchment paper. The messages would say things like, help us. Donna had spoken to a medium after noticing that drops of blood had randomly appeared on the doll. And the medium had said that a seven-year-old girl named Annabelle, who used to play in the fields of where their building now stands, was possessing the doll, and that her lifeless body was discovered in those same fields. Donna and Angie felt bad, so they allowed the spirit that they thought was Annabelle to stay with them and possess the doll. It's said that God does not allow child spirits to possess dolls. It was, in fact, a demon inside the doll that was impersonating a child's spirit. Lou didn't like the doll very much and warned Donna that it was evil. And one night when Lou was asleep, he woke up and realized that he was unable to move. He saw the doll at his feet and watched as it slowly glided up his leg and over his chest and the doll had started to strangle him until he blacked out. Finishing it up at our number one spot, we have the Jewish Dybbuks. Many of you have probably seen an example of a Dybbuk in popular horror movies such as The Possession or The Unborn. However, early tales of its existence date back to the word of mouth, specifically 17th century tales of Polish and German Jews. While many malevolent spirits remain invisible or take on the form of some hideous creature, the Dybbuk looks very much like a human. It often resembles a person familiar to the community it invades. The first ever interpretation of a Dybbuk is a malevolent spirit of a dead person who reaches out to possess living people who are ill and sick. They bind onto the human soul, influencing their actions and behaviors. When a Dybbuk enters your body, it means you have done continuous bad deeds, which opens the door to your soul. This is the case that inspired The Exorcist. The Exorcist is a film that will always be remembered for its spinning heads, Holy Spirit. and its explicit yet somewhat appropriate dialogue. Stick your f up her, f you mother f worthless f sucker. Be silent. Oh. And it's even funnier to think that the author of the novel that inspired the film, William Blady, started off writing comedy. Little did he know, his scary side would produce one of the greatest horror movies of all time. Exorcist was an immediate hit to the box office when it hit theaters in 1973, racking up over $400 million along with winning many Academy Awards, Best Screenplay, and Golden Globe Award, Best Screenplay and Director. With worldwide attention, this led many pockets of fans to find out if they saw on screen was in fact a true story. And unfortunately, it was. It all started in 1940 Maryland when Roland was born into a German family. He was an only child, but as time went on, he eventually formed the bond with his Aunt Harriet. Other than showing Roland the ropes to life, such as riding a bike or learning to save money, she had a very spiritual approach instead. Aunt Harriet felt very connected to the occult and would even go as far as showing Roland a Ouija board in which he showed quick interest in, playing it almost daily at one point. Author Thomas B. Allen wrote a story on Roland Doe, and he claimed that shortly after his Aunt Harriet passed away, the family began to report very strange occurrences from 
inside of their home. Some of these include scratching sounds from the floors and the walls, constant mold and water damage, and I know what you're thinking, that could just be some simple house issues. Well that's what the family said at first, until things got a lot worse. Furniture would begin to move on its own, specifically Roland's mattress would move around in the middle of the night, shaking his body with it. Roland claimed that he attempted to contact his deceased aunt via the Ouija board prior to these events, which only made it more reason to believe something supernatural was behind it all. At this point, they knew what whatever was happening to him was in fact real and they needed to do something about it before it just got worse. They seeked out every expert including medical professionals, psychologists, except it wasn't until they decided to turn to God and ask their local Lutheran minister, Luther Miles Scholz. He was just perfect for the job because he was a firm believer of parapsychology, which is for those who don't know, the study of alleged psychic phenomena. Even though this was more so related to those who had near death experiences, Roland's case was far too interesting to not consider. He then decided to conduct his own self experiment with the boy by taking him to his house to observe his actions, behaviors, and more importantly, what's going on around him. Shortly afterwards, his house became the scene of many alarming events, including unexplained noises, rearranged furniture, and even flying objects. And to back up these claims, there are about 48 witnesses to these events. And after being examined by medical and psychiatric doctors, they offered no explanation to the events, only describing it as supernatural. Scholz knew he was out of his element and offered the advice to seek out a Catholic priest for further assistance. The family was so fearful at this point that they would do anything. They weren't religious, but then they decided to have Roland baptized. Except even this would prove impossible. As he was being baptized, the priests were met with extreme rage, so they decided to stop altogether and just call it. They then went to the local Catholic priest, Father E. Albert Hughes, who just gave them some holy water and candles and just basically told them, yup, good luck guys. After realizing nothing was going to help Roland out and that his conditions were just worsening, they went back to the priest. This is when Father Hughes conducted an exorcism on Roland at Georgetown University Hospital, which is a Jesuit institution. During the exorcism, Roland managed to break free from his restraints and lash out at the priest's arm with a bed spring causing the ritual to end abruptly. After this, the family then traveled out to St. Louis, Missouri in hopes of finding someone capable of helping Roland. One of Roland's cousins then spoke to his professors at the St. Louis University named Walter Holleran, who then contacted another priest by the name of William S. Boder. These priests agreed to see what's up and after coming to one of the relatives' homes where Roland was staying, they concluded there was definitely something supernatural going on. They jotted down notes like shaking bed, flying objects, saying the boy was speaking in a growling voice, and even speaking in Latin, which was nothing new at this point, but only further confirmed that the boy was indeed possessed. Bodern then went to the Archbishop in order to request another exorcism in which he was granted. On the final exorcism at Alexian Brothers Hospital, Bodern along with Father Holleron and Van Roo took Ronald to deep waters. This is the event that the movie takes parts of because this is where things went from bad to worse. Father Holleran will report in his notes that the words evil and hell would appear on the teenager's body out of nowhere. When the priest called upon the saints of heaven for assistance, this is when they were called the mattress was violently shaken. And when they started to provoke the demon further, the possessed Roland lunged out at Holleran, breaking his nose completely. After a while, the priest called upon Saint Michael to expel Satan from his body. Seven minutes later, and Roland would come out of a trance-like state with his first words being, he's gone. When they asked the boy what he's just experienced, he's claimed to see the vision of Saint Michael vanishing Satan on a great battlefield. However, this is all speculated. Reporters were also all over the case due to the sheer mystery of it all. When they interviewed Father Holleran, he said that Roland Doe was saved and the devil had been expelled from his body. Now how did the true story align with the movie, The Exorcist? Well it all started thanks to this article in the Washington Post which reported in August 1949 that priests have indeed performed an exorcism. However, this would only bring small attention as the article left out many details including the specifics of the exorcism, the name of the subject, and any solid evidence backing up the claim. It wasn't until William Peter Blady, the writer I mentioned in the beginning, wrote the novel, The Exorcist. He based the whole premise off the unofficial diaries kept by Father Holleran and Bodern, who were two of the three priests that were present during the exorcism in the first place. The moment the book was released, it was an instant hit, staying on the bestseller list for over 54 weeks straight. The international attention influenced them to create a movie under the same name in 1973. However, as we see now, the movie and the true story have many clear differences. For example, the material turned a teenage boy named Roland into a 12 year old girl named Regan. Another clear difference to mention is that Roland never turned his head 360 degrees. That was only in the movie. Roland did, however, curse profusely, vomit everywhere, gain scratches out of nowhere, and was even attempting to hurt the priest involved. So despite the movie not being one for one, they did enough to give justice to the true story. It wasn't until five years after the movie was released in 1978 when evidence started to convince the public further. Workmen demolishing part of the St. Louis Hospital where Roland has stayed were removing furniture. In a locked room, they discovered an unofficial record of his visit tucked underneath a drawer. The document went into detail 
detail about those four nights the priest tried to exercise Roland. Both the movie and the true story do have good endings though. Both victims eventually got the demon expelled and live out the rest of their lives. So what happened to Roland Doe after the exorcism? So first of all, as I mentioned, his real name had been confirmed to be Roland Edwin Hunkler. And after he underwent all the exorcisms, he and his family moved back to their old home in the East Coast and lived out a pretty normal life. After a few years, Roland would become a full-fledged NASA engineer and he remained as one for 40 years. During this whole time, he hid his true identity and the fact that he was a victim of a demonic possession in fear of being judged at his own workplace. As a NASA employee, he had a lot to contribute as well. He helped patent a technology that allowed space shuttle panels to tolerate excessive heat, but apart from these advances, he would always be worried about his past being revealed. An unnamed source claimed, quote, on Halloween, we always left the house because he figured someone would come to his residence and know where he lived and never let him have peace. He had a terrible life from worry, worry, worry. He would eventually retire at the agency in 2001, and 19 years later in 2020, he would pass away from a stroke. Shockingly, a priest arrived just before his death to give him his last rites, even though he never recalled asking for one. He just thought it was a sign from God and just took it. First of all, the church doesn't believe that every suspected case of demons or possession are true, and the Catholic Church does not fake exorcism. So for all you skeptics, the only reasonable thing to point out is if Roland Doe was acting irrationally, or was he actually possessed by the devil? Skeptic Joe Nickel wrote, quote, simply no credible evidence to suggest that the boy was possessed by demons or evil spirits and maintains the symptoms of possession can be childishly simple to fake. Nickel dismissed suggestions that supernatural forces made scratchings or even markings or caused words to appear on the teenager's body in unreachable places. He continued saying, quote, a determined youth, probably even without a wall mirror, could easily have managed such a feat. If it actually occurred, although the scratch messages proliferated, they never again appeared on a difficult to reach portion of the boy's anatomy. On one occasion, the boy was reportedly seen scratching the words hell and Christ on his chest by using his own fingernails. Nickel would release a longer statement saying, quote, nothing that was reliably reported in the case was beyond the abilities of a teenager to produce. The tantrums, trances, move furniture, hurled objects, automatic writing, superficial scratches, and other phenomena were just the kind of things someone at Roland's age could accomplish, just as others have done before and since. Indeed, the elements of poltergeist phenomena, spiritual communication, and demonic possession taken both separately and especially together as one progressed to the other suggests nothing so much as role playing involving trickery. He concluded by saying that Roland was nothing more than just an agitated teenager. Let me know what you guys think. Do you guys believe in the true story of Roland Doe or was it just made for quick publicity? This is definitely one of those cases that will make you scratch your head and question what really went down in these hospital rooms. Also, what do you guys think about the movie? After hearing the true story, do you think they did a good job? I want to know all your thoughts in the comments section below. Starting off this countdown at number 10, Jin. This video was taken by a YouTuber who regularly posts videos and doesn't post videos about ghosts. But he was in his room one night and his cat started to act weird. It was about 1 a.m and um, it was in my bedroom and he was staring at the wall behind me and off to the side sort of into the corner of the room some people say gins and um, spirits and stuff are often in corners of rooms so if you believe in ghosts and um, things and stuff then um, get a cat or maybe don't get a cat because it will probably freak you out when it does this, if it does this. So enjoy the rest of this video, I guess. You can hear him say in the video that jinn tend to hide in corners. And a jinn, if you don't know, is a type of evil spirit or demon. It's said that they are made of, quote, smokeless fire. And they can also possess humans. It's said that Jin are responsible for all kinds of accidents and deadly diseases. On a more fun note, the cat's name is Peanuts, which is just so adorable. Now at number nine, Demon Reflection. This video was captured inside the home where a family had seen their dog start to act strange. The dog walks through the back door staring at what looks like its reflection. But when the dog walks away, the reflection is still there. Maybe there's another dog behind the camera we can't see, but to me, before the reflection looked like a dog, but after it looked like a demon. Like I looked closer and I could like see like a face, but I, I hate it, so no. Coming in at number eight, Spirit Box. 
A spirit box, if you don't know, is also known as an EMF reader. It picks up on different radio sequences, which helps spirits communicate with us. For this one, Mike Jamison had claimed that spirits and demons were haunting his home. He had already had multiple security cameras set up that had captured odd things. But for this one, his dog Buckeye started to act really weird walking back and forth from his bedroom to the basement stairs. Mike decided to start using the spirit box to see if it would pick up anything. Video frequencies looking for sound. Paranormal researchers believe that these sounds come from ghosts or supernatural entities. Yeah, what's up, man? You just said my name. <laughs> That's a, that's a dog. In a later clip, we see more activity in the scary video as the dog heads for the basement stairs. In a later clip, when Mike had walked to the basement stairs, his dog stood there for about three minutes, and just as his camera started to bug out and act weird, his dog went down the stairs and the spirit box said the word dog. Oh, losing focus, losing focus, oh my god. Wow, dude, see? Yeah, my camera just lost focus and I got goosebumps, spirits. Very freaky, I know. Here at number seven, demon terrorizing cats. This footage was filmed while a child and their mother were on vacation and left the cats at home. They had a house sitter who would come by the house every other morning to look after them. After the five day vacation, they came back and noticed that their cats had been acting strange. So they decided to check the security camera footage and this is what they found. The camera then turned away and stayed there until they returned home. Right when they came home, the cats darted towards the front door trying to get out. Did you guys also notice the shadow at the front door? Let's run the clip again. Yep, pretty clear to me, I can see that shadow. Taking number six is dog ritual. In a loving home with a few dogs and a family, there's one dog that's different from the rest. Every night around 9.15 p.m., the dog leaves everyone else in the living room and goes to the kitchen to stare at one specific corner for 45 minutes. Dark room near the kitchen. There, Bella sits and stares at one corner of the room as if intently watching something. The dog will watch the corner for up to 45 minutes, occasionally raising her ears as if she hears something. No matter who's talking to the dog or what they're saying, she will never break her eyes away from that one corner. Halfway number five, orange cat. In this video, a woman was taking a video of her playing with her cats when one cat decided to lay down. When it looks as though it spots something and suddenly dives out of the way. Just as it does, a strange ghost-like apparition moves past the camera. The cat seems to react to the ghostly shape just before it can be seen on film. Has this YouTuber accidentally captured a ghost on camera while- Suddenly the orange cat gets scared and runs away and just after a bright orb can be seen passing by. This cat was very clearly disturbed by whatever that was and I wouldn't want to meet it. Now at number four, demon in the kitchen. A woman had claimed her house is being haunted by a demon. One night she got up from sleeping and went to the kitchen to get a glass of water when her dog was following her but then wouldn't fully enter the kitchen. So she started recording. It's okay, come on. It's okay. It's okay, come on.
As you can see, the dog is standing just behind the entrance of the kitchen and he won't go in. He seems to be looking at the wall just in front of him and then starts aggressively barking. No matter what the woman says, he won't follow her. She offers the dog treats and still no. It's like you can see him try to go in, but he's scared and can't bring himself to do it. Coming in at number three, Demon on the Dresser. In this video, a woman was in her room when the cat started to stare at the dresser in the room and started to pace back and forth. The cat's hair on its back then stood up, which never means anything good. Cat's hair on their back will often stand up when they are scared. cat starts to stand on its back legs, and I did some research on this one. When cats feel threatened by a devious predator, they will often attempt to make themselves appear as large as possible. You guessed it, perching on the back of its legs is part of this survival tactic. Here at number two, demon pushes dog. In this video, a daughter and her mom were sitting on the couch when their dog started to bark at the dark corner in their house. Now it would be easy to say, oh, the dog probably just thought it heard something and is randomly freaking out, but the dog keeps barking for a while. This happens. <laughs> then the mom says to the daughter, if the dog goes flying across that rug jade, and then it looks like the dog gets suddenly pushed. If this spear is pushing the dog, chances are it's not friendly, especially in a dark corner. Taking our number one spot, Poltergeist plays with dog. A man would always come home to his living room being trashed and he assumed it was his dog misbehaving when he was gone. So he set up a security camera and then checked the footage and this is what he found. He is shocked. First, the radio randomly turned on by itself and then started switching stations, which ghosts are known for doing. But then the dog's ball started to roll off the couch when it was perfectly still before. The dog clearly doesn't seem bothered by this, but this one just doesn't feel right.